in the queue for a second while I do this because it's very important that I see that everything is working. And then I talk because I don't want there to be any kind of silence. So you're going to sit there. Hey, it's working. For a nice. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to mattnews.biz, the podcast where I share my thoughts and opinions and beliefs that have been lovingly dubbed Matt News. This episode is brought to you unofficially by Restream. Restream is the best way to live stream to YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and 30 plus streaming sites all at once. Expand your audience with multi streaming today at restream.io. Tonight's guest is Nate Baranowski. He is a street painter, muralist, chalk artist, fine artist, and you can check out his work at natebaranowski.com. And he's also a new father. Please welcome on Nate Baranowski. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how are you? How are you doing? I am doing great. I am currently working on a mural. Um, so for the first time since my boy was born, I am actually putting in full days of work, okay. which it's been a while. So actually painting for 10 hours at a stretch is actually a little bit difficult for me. Oh, <laughs> so where are you I've at right lazy. Now? Where are you uh, at? I'm on day. Uh, well, I'm in, in Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, I'm on day three of four on this mural. Oh, nice. So nice. are you so uh, getting to the point where I hate it, but like I need to fix it and then. Hopefully it'll be great by the end. <laughs> well, as long as the rain doesn't wash it away like it did at Epcot. Oh man! But <laughs> this one is indoors and permanent in paint, so nice. That is, uh, don't nice, have to worry about nice. rain this time. Nice. Um, I was just about to ask you a question, and then I forgot what I was going to ask you. Uh, oh, are you posting your progress or anything on your Instagram? I am not. Uh, not for this one. Um, okay. Mostly because I'm not super happy with my progress <laughs> shots at the moment. So <laughs> I'm too embarrassed to to share them. But I will correct all of these mistakes and hopefully post something great at the end. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so anyone who's uh, joining us uh, either on Facebook, YouTube, or even Twitch, um, you can ask a question anywhere in the comment section or the chat, and we will be able to see that here on our side as well. And we're going to save uh, reserve a Q&R um, kind of time at the end and answer your questions like that. So please feel free to interact with us um, as the show goes on. Nate. Yes. How is it being a new father? Whew. It is amazing for one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I try not to sound really cliche when I talk about uh, fatherhood because I know it gets really easy to like do that. And I want to try to be like realistic with it. But it is amazing to be so connected to a human that does not know you exist or that you exist after you leave his field of view. Right. Um, but like there is this desire i i was um i've tell i've told a few people now that like it's actually not to get like super spiritual super quick but <laughs> like it is definitely teaching me the way that god loves us because i so badly want my little six week old baby to know how much i love him mm -hmm. that like i don't even like i want him to love me back and show right. that but like he doesn't grasp the fact that how much I love him. Mm -hmm. And like it's this this feeling of like, oh, man, I'm so excited for him to grow up so he can know to the extent to which I love him. So, right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's been pretty cool traveling and having him not around has been a little difficult because I see pictures of him during the day and I'm like, oh, I want to hold that guy. And <laughs> yeah, I'm a big mush ball. Yeah, but I mean, but this job, like you were saying, this is your first travel job. Yeah, since right, You're right. Yeah. Uh, so how 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 long has that been? How old is your baby? Six weeks. Um, probably actually going on seven, almost seven. Wow, I feel like it's. I feel like he should be older than that. I feel like it's been longer <laughs> than that. <laughs> it feels like a long time, and it also feels like just yesterday. So. Yeah. Um. So I know we're not talking about anything in particular. So I'm just gonna kind of shoot from the hip. I love um, the fact that like the title for this was like not anything in particular, but like <laughs> everything important. I was like, yeah, that's my, my bio yeah. line. Well, I always try to make quippy uh, titles for all of my episodes, except love for the it. last two, which were, you know, very important topics. So I was sure. like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be quippy with this one. Nothing like moving from, from important <laughs> topics to 
me, just kind of a Joe Schmo with a bunch of opinions. But that's the but that's the beauty of MattNews.biz. It's literally anything. It's literally whatever I feel like talking about, and that's what I really love about it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into art? Cause I, I don't know. I know I've chatted with you a little bit about mm-hmm. it, but I've never really got into it. How did you get into, um, art? Well, I mean, as you can imagine, always have been creating art, always loved it. Um, but at a younger age, definitely had the thought of this can't be a business. I mean, mm-hmm. this can't be a career. This is just going to be a hobby. Like as a kid, I wanted to be a Disney animator. Like that was my dream. Like I was trying to do like little flip books of Lumiere, like when I was a kid. Um, And then, so I went to school for industrial design. So I thought to myself, if I make products and I like learn modeling and stuff, that's artistic, but also like will lead to a career sort of thing. And from there, after moving down to Florida, I had the uh, opportunity to work at a place that did themed entertainment design uh like that worked for the theme parks so i was able to like do some design stuff there and i was like hold on a second this is really cool uh but while i was doing that oh and back sorry going back a little bit back in college i did a little side job doing chalk art um Mm. so that became my like hey make it like 40 bucks here and there Um, right so i was doing like announcements and stuff on the quad um and then when i moved down to florida i found all these chalk festivals and I started going to them just for fun on the weekends. Um, and then, so after like a couple years of doing this, I was like, you know what? Some people are paying me for this. And I started doing a few murals and things here and there. Um, so that's kind of how I started getting into it and eventually said, you know what? I want to try, like, make a go of this. So yeah. 20, 2015 is when I started like full freelance art. Like, I'm just going to like go all out. And so, and I'm still here. I'm not saying, uh, that it's like a forever thing, but it's a for five years I have been a freelance artist. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. dying here from cough. Oh, I'm saying. Oh, you're all right. Well, actually, I've, I've been I've been wanting to grab my water, but I was like waiting. I was just yeah, waiting you didn't want to be unprofessional like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I had Robles on, he uh, he like coughed right into the microphone, and I uh, I told him I'm gonna keep it in there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Run it out. Um, so, how, so how did you make the move from? You know, I know you said two, 2015. That's when you really mm-hmm. started professionally. So, right. how did you make that jump from? You know, not like professional side to hustle professional. to professional. Yeah. So, I what I ended up doing is I started. I had a lot of freedom in my design job, and what I started doing was just working a little bit less and less and i was getting these jobs that were taking me from friday to monday so i was able to like just work less time um and i know some people don't have the flexibility to like kind Mm -hmm. of pursue that side hustle without um kind of having a detrimental effect on your day job but i had was in like the great position of being able to like kind of head into that um a little little by little and then i was making enough that i thought well and i also was in a fortunate position where my wife was working so i was like mm-hmm. all right we have one income in our family i'm going to give this a year like we, we talked about it and we said okay we're going to give it a try and see what happens if a year goes by and it's like no this can't work then like we'll just i'll head back to where i came from or you know go a different direction yeah. so i did the first year and it was i i got work but it was just not a lot of money. Like it was just like I I could probably live on it if it was just me by myself. But like for a couple, like, oh, that's not great. But it was enough to go, okay, let's give year two a try. Right. And it went and it went from like the year two was a big uh, explosion for me with a lot more jobs and a lot more uh, like, all right, this is career type money sort of thing. So how much of it was like actually the art and how much of it was like you just putting yourself out there and networking? Mm. I would say it was probably more networking, more um, talking to people. And and especially with these festivals, I started 
I got to know chalk artists that were already doing it professionally. And the way I got started is there were several art- artists that needed assistance on jobs. And so basically, mm-hmm. like, I, w- I got brought in on it. It's so, like that was some of my earliest opportunities. And that was just because I got to know, like, the scene from going to festivals where I was not getting paid at all. It was just, I just love doing this. And so I'm going to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I, you've probably seen some of my drawings and stuff like that. that I've been mm-hmm. doing on Instagram. Yeah. Um, I, st- the thing is, is all of my drawings are me copying other people's drawings because I don't feel confident enough to do my own stuff. Uh-huh. Like, so how do I make that transition? How do I make that leap into like, I'm going to start drawing my own, stuff because i know i know some most of your chalk art is actually you reproducing something else right exactly um yeah um for example the mural i'm working on right now is designed by me uh it's a completely original piece and i think because of that i it's a lot more nerve-wracking for me like it Mm -hmm. is like i understand that it is difficult to do your own thing because you know you have it's not a matter of just reproducing something else. Like for example, I've always been very good at reproducing other work. Like I can, I just, I can look at something and just kind of forge it basically. So when it comes to reproducing things, like no problem, I can copy any style, like go for it that way. But doing my own thing definitely requires like, do I have a style? Do I have, and I know sometimes when I look at my own art, I actually see in it, uh, some of the things I don't like from when I started drawing when I was a kid, like some yeah. of those same ways that I draw people and like some of those, like what I don't like are things that like, ah, oh, I just never like advanced that part of my, my uh, repertoire. So advice mm-hmm. for you is you just kind of have to do it yeah, and you have to, well, I would recommend work on it a little bit, leave it, work on something else, come back to your own piece and do it piece by piece because you will find yourself getting more frustrated Mm -hmm. with your own work than copying someone else's. So you kind of have to give yourself a little bit more grace of like, okay, I'm going to be mad at it and by turn mad at myself and I need to like step away from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's hard for me to do because, um, you can ask, you can ask Nikki. Um, I'm the kind of guy that like, Hey, I've started something. I've got to finish it before I mm. do the next thing. And so it's really hard for me to step away. I've actually, I actually started drawing, uh, cause, um, hold on. So, Oh, it's so, portfolio review time. Here well, we go. Yeah. No, I don't want to do all that. <laughs> um, I just want to like, so, 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 uh, friend of friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, Jared, um, young, um, was going to get rid of this tablet. You know, and so I was like, uh, bro, I'll take it and uh, I'll try it out and see. Mm -hmm. And it's an Android tablet. It's not as it's not like fast or anything like that. It's really slow loading. Um, But that's what I've been drawing with. And I found that I actually prefer it. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, I prefer drawing on a tablet than I do on paper. And so like this is what I'm working on right now. And I hate it. Like I absolutely just hate it. Um I hear from a, a little a little bird at the moment that you maybe lack patience in in our in our tech. <laughs> maybe you're <laughs> she's Look outed you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Look not that I love. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah, I don't know. Again. I mean, I like the lighting. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to work on. Like, I'm trying to do like the going from black, you know, uh, to a to a piece. I did this one the other day. Um, this one's actually like my favorite right now. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. That one's probably my favorite so far. So here's, here's something for you. Yes. Um, every artist that I truly respect and think is amazing. I, they have something in common. They always take their time with their work. Always. Like I've never looked at someone's art, talked to them about it. And it's like, and I'm considered like pretty fast in what okay. I do, but actually like, here's what I recommend. Here's my mm-hmm. recommendation for you. Break down every project or every piece that you're going to draw into several stages. And if you need to have something, <laughs> <laughs> if you need to have something complete, complete a stage and then walk away from it because viewing art as 
not really finished can mm-hmm. actually be a good thing because then you can kind of work over it. Like, especially, you know, certain like oil painters will just rework and work and let it dry for a couple of weeks, which I've never gotten to oil painting because I can't stand the idea of being like, wait, how long do I have to wait till I yeah. can get some more? Yeah. Like, you'll you be the guy with the blow dryer. You'll be the guy with the blow dryer, like blow dry, dry. <laughs> exactly. So yes, I mean, like I would break it down into smaller pieces. Um, and for example, I'd be like, all right, tonight I'm going to sit down and I'm going to sketch something out. I'm not going to put any color on it. I'm not going to put any values on it. I'm just going to sketch it out. I'm going to work on it. When I'm finished with that, I'm going to walk away. And I'm going to mm-hmm. come back and I'm going to do, all right, I'm going to put on value. I'm just going to put black and white value. I'm just going to put it down. And you work on that for a while and you walk away. And what you get is you get fresh eyes. And fresh eyes, when it comes to art, is some of the greatest tools that you have because every day you pop up you will see something different there's just like fatigue or uh you know familiarity that actually can hurt your art because all you're seeing is you know one particular thing but like the next day you come to it it's like whoa hold on a second that nose that nostril needs to be smaller and it's just and and if you were working digitally flip your art often what do you mean flip like flip the canvas like actually like if you're working in something that you can like mirror it Mm -hmm. if you ever mirror something uh you'll see it with it that gives you fresh eyes without actually having to wait so maybe i shouldn't have told you that but like yeah if you ever work anything digitally if you give it a flip um anyone who works in photoshop will like have a hot key that basically flips the canvas okay Hmm. yeah yeah, I, I guess that's just, that's something I need to work on is just patience because I want to finish it. And I, yeah, I think, me too. You and me both. Yeah, I, I think what really gets me though is you know like YouTube artists or even TikTok artists. You know, they're like you know they'll they'll do the speed, uh, they'll speed it up, of course, but sure. it's still it's like you know it still looks like it took less than a day for them to to work on it and to do it and to get it done. Right, but you did um, it in fifteen seconds because you condensed it to TikTok. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and then also too, like I like caricature artists. I like the way like they work um, and they work really fast. They have to, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've thought about getting into that. I just don't know how, I think what I would want to learn is like how uh, to like how to pick out features that you want to draw. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that that's a different type of skill set that I, I respect those who can just like look at a face and be like, all right, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I think I'm done with the art questions. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you for coming to Art Corner. If you have yeah. any questions about art, put them in the chat. <laughs> put them in the chat, and we'll come back to it. Um, so uh, I heard a, a little birdie told me that you recently went to a uh, Black Lives Matter um, rally. And recently, I mean, like it's been uh, like a month right. or so. Right. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what made you want to go to it sure. and how, how was it? Yeah. Um, so I live in Chicago, um, mm. and I, it was, Oh, I'm really bad with dates, but at some point in time, what happened is a bunch of, uh, different churches came together to do a, uh, basically a, a protest march that was, uh, part, um, you know, a praying for peace and for peaceful demonstrations, but also um, uh, definitely, I mean, it was not too long after George Floyd. And I think it was maybe right after Breonna Taylor, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, also the racial injustice and the divide within the church. uh, And Mm -hmm. the fact that this was put on, I think in Chicago, it was um, several Christian um, churches, but also some uh, Jewish synagogues i'm mm-hmm. sorry i'm very bad and uh synagogues yep that's yes. Jewish. <laughs> got it um and so yeah all of these organizations came together and our church had a, a contingency from it and i was like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna go to my first protest and i was frankly very very scared because i had never been to like seriously never marched in anything ever yeah um so i was like well, do i do i make a sign do i what, what do i do and you know like what if I get there and someone yells something that I don't agree with? Do I have to like, you know, what part of me like participating uh, 
you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so it was, it was really, really cool. We, we probably walked for, you know, five miles or so, uh, down Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in Chicago. Um, and you know, everyone was very peaceful, respectful. Like that was part of the the thing is that, um, it is, you know, sadly the the case that when a protest um turns into rioting or turns into violence um it sadly under undercuts a lot of the message of the protest and it's uh it can be used to basically discount what the the protest is about so uh it was a very it was very cool the the leaders of the march said like hey you respect this um this issue Mm -hmm. by yeah, by respecting uh, police as they, you know, are around and also like respecting the area and those who live in this area. Yeah. Um, so is, is it, was it being a peaceful kind of what protest or march or whatever is that's, that's what kind of drew you to it. Like, well, if it's going to be peaceful, I'm going to attend it. Yeah. I think that was, I mean, I think that was part of the, uh, at least for me, uh, never having gone to a protest before the -hmm. fact that there was definitely one, it it was, you know, I was there with members of my small group from church and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm with you guys here. And I'm with like our pastors walked into it as well, but also like the, the peace aspect of it was definitely like, it felt, I don't know. It felt good for me because I was scared (laughs) and I wanted to. Yeah, you know, I wanted to participate. Um, yeah, it it has definitely been. I think since then, um, you know, there's all sorts of discussions around capital letters Black Lives Matter versus lowercase Black Lives Matter. Um, but it was it was good for me, especially in that moment, to be able to, you know, basically say Black Lives Matter in a very like powerful way with the rest of my church uh because um it is in christian circles depending on the political persuasion of your church um even saying that is fairly loaded and so Mm -hmm. it was kind of cool being able to be with my small group and be like hey we are pro jesus we are pro all people and we are pro specifically black lives yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, like, I actually have a buddy of mine who I want to have on this podcast, um, but he he's very much a person that um, uh, kind of defaults to whenever you're having an argument, he, he defaults to, well, do you believe that Black Lives Matter? Can you say those words specifically, Black Lives Matter? Sure. And uh, whenever I'm having a conversation with him, um, it's usually very public. And so uh, I, I tell him, like, I'm not going to say those words in that mm. order um, mm. because it because I know people who associate the, those terms with the organization. Sure. And, you know, and um, so and that's kind of the, that what you're talking about, the capital Black Lives Matter and the lowercase Black Lives right. Matter. Um, and, and I and I hate the fact that it's, you know, it, you have that contention where you can't right. just say like, I know what black lives matter means. I know that it means that I value the lives of black people, you know, right. and, and you can't just say that you can't just say, well, I believe black lives matter because it has so much baggage with it. Mm-hmm. Um, did you find yourself um, before going to the protest, having those same thoughts and then kind of growing past it? Yeah, sure. The, um, I, I don't know. I think it wasn't, um, I don't know it's 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 tricky for me because I think I when it comes to Black Lives Matter, I'm talking like organizationally versus you know the 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 concept. Um, right. I definitely have you know the okay people that I love that I know in Chicago um, have been impacted positively by the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, I think it was for me, it was, okay, whether this is, uh, tied to an organization or not me learning and, uh, showing up, um, I think in, I think in general, I'm going to go kind of back up a little bit. I think mm-hmm. we are often, uh, a little nervous about what our, 
participation in different things will look like to the outside right. and or how it will come across. And I think I made the decision. I would rather learn about an organization or learn about the people within it or learn about the issues um, without being concerned that people that know me would go, hold on a second. Are you in support of everything that Black Lives Matter stands for sort of thing? Right. Because when those conversations happen, we can have that discussion. Uh, but if not, I mean, people will assume all sorts of things about us all the time. So I think that's my, that was kind of my, my mindset going in is, you know what, like if I would rather show up and learn and especially like represent the church mm -hmm. in, in some ways. And I think that's a, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's also similar. I mean, not to, this is not an equivalency, but right. Uh, when it comes to going to a, a, a pride event or, mm -hmm. or marching with, uh, you know, gay brothers and sisters, like to me, it's the, okay, people can assume different things about what I believe, mm -hmm. but like by, sh by showing up and by learning and by being in solidarity with someone, then I can kind of learn along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes, that makes a lot of sense because for me, it, it does stink. Like it, it does stink that you have, you can't just say, you know, I support, um, you know, when people question, you know, Hey, are you supporting that organization? And do you agree with everything it is? It's, it, I mean, if we talk about politics, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. And so it's like, oh, so you, you're for abortion. It's like, right. Well, Moral not necessarily. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they package you the whole the whole deal, and I think that's right. uh, that's a trap I fall into because I really, um, um, it's really hard to because I want to be associated with something where I can literally just say I am a blank, right? And this and and everybody knows exactly what you are because we all want to belong to a clan. We all want to be able to say me and all these people who are, say the same thing we all identify as the same and we hold all of these together and uh, like yeah you can't really do that i mean sadly right now to say i'm a christian is yeah. not uh i mean it's hopefully we <laughs> we hold to a uh, very similar like core jesus foundation uh, but it also doesn't mean that your, you know, beliefs and politics are the same. Right. Well, some people do assume that's what it means, but I would oh, yeah. push back on that and say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people assume, you know, well, you're, uh, you're a Christian. You're obviously voting red. You're obviously yep. voting Donald Trump and everything like that. And it's like, no, not necessarily. We can have a conversation about that and I can let you know, you know, right. How, how I'm taking this voting season. Um, right. and, and, you know, yeah. Um, well, are we going to talk politics now? We do. You want, do you want to? We can. I, I, this I is. Always, the, I always want to. I, I try to tread lightly. Oh, okay, okay. Hold on a second. Wait, we we don't need to then. I kind of want to though. No, no. I, 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 sure. no I feel like I'm baiting you into it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very easy subject to bait me into. Sure. Um, sure. Well, let's kind so of. You had another kinda, question. Let, yeah, let's kind of uh, scale. Oh, oh, Nikki said yes. Nikki gave me permission. Ooh, ooh. How about this? We'll start off the, like this. We'll start off like this. We'll we'll kind of scave we'll the political. It. We'll kind of scave it, and we'll talk about uh, critical race theory because I know right. you mentioned oh, yeah. it I to me, and so uh, I know a little bit about critical race theory. Um, I've listened to uh, the Free Mind podcast. There's a plug for you, Robles. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I've listened to their, um, but I do feel like uh, the Free Mind podcast. I don't know if you ever listened to Seth and Nerva, their I podcast. Yes. <clears throat> I, I feel like it's very one sided. <laughs> right. It is. It is a very right leaning podcast. Correct. Um, and so uh, I try it, it, but it's very hard to find um, for me at least, and that might be because of my algorithms. Um, it's hard to find uh, left. Um, uh, critical race theory videos right. or anything like that. Um, but also too, the ones that I do find are sound like they're kind of nuts. Mm. Mm. Um, and that was me just like literally just throwing it out there. But yeah. um, I, I, you know, uh, so in your own words, mm -hmm. if you could try to explain yes. critical race theory to me. 
Oh man. And it's okay. kind of hard because we're both white. So it's like, it makes right. It right. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So I mean, it, this is sort of what I've gathered through my, uh, I am not a professor here, but I would say mm-hmm. that it is, I would say probably the most common uh, worldview or way to look at something in the United States right now. Um, and especially um, highlighting racial inequality in the U S it has been, you know, more popularized um Mm. but this that there are uh, oppressors and the oppressed and that uh in these different areas of our life uh if as a a white person uh you have been in the oppressor group in in america uh and if you're a black person you've been in the oppressed group um and that these two different sides um my what is either built into my teaching or the system that I'm in uh, is meant to keep me in the power position, and then in in, in my decision basically is uh, whether subconsciously or consciously is to try to stay stay up there. Right. Um, and same thing with the same dynamic for men and women as power, you know, oppressor oppressed, um, straight uh, versus gay. Um, what's uh, young versus old, older, maybe mm-hmm. uh, a couple and more things. Al- and you're also placing these into like dichotomies as well. Like, you know, um, right. we know like there is intersectionality, um, right. but there's also, I mean, if you want to go with uh, the transgender, you know, I mean, it's right. not male versus female, it's, exactly. you know, cis versus trans. Right. Exactly. So then the intersectionality of, okay, you are a, uh, black trans, and then you know where you're, where, maybe where you're from in the mm-hmm. United States, or you know that sort of different areas that kind of come all together, right. uh, or or your religion. So uh, another thing, uh, kind of contentious thing in critical theory is that there is a lot of okay, if you are a Christian in the U.S., you have been in more of the oppressor group. It is versus if you are Jewish or Muslim. Um, I think those are the probably the two that would probably fit into, and even like in like kind of it's Judeo Christian. I think maybe Jewish, you can kind of ride both sides depending on sort of thing. But that, I mean, like the overall view there is that, and if you're in the oppressed group or if you're in a group that has kind of been tamped down, uh, like being woke is Mm -hmm. basically being able to say like, I realize that the systems are against me. Um, and that I need to kind of break out of that and see that, uh, this is, you know, it's kind of meant to kind of keep me down. Um, and then if you are a white, uh, cis male, Mm -hmm. like myself, you, you know, your, your job is to realize that, uh, you either consciously or subconsciously need to figure out there are things in my raising and things in the education system that have, I need to kind of like break through that and see the areas in which I have been um, prejudiced basically. Right. Yeah. The, so that's sort of like the problem statement is that, and some of the solution statement of critical race theory is for me uh, specifically me to be educated more and figure out the ways that I have privilege over someone who's in a different section um, and learn and listen from those who have different lived experiences. Now where it gets into more uh, dicey, almost theological takes is this idea of truth being my truth and Mm -hmm. uh, truth experience. Um, To me, that's not, uh, I don't have that intellectual of a mind. So that part of it is not as interesting to me um, because like, I think, all right, I could kind of reason through the fact of like, all right, I think there is truth and that, but I also think that hearing someone's lived experience does change your opinion of someone. Yeah, yeah, you're you're talking about um, you know the 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 idea of an objective and subjective truth. Like it right. doesn't really interest you either or because you think that the subjective truth can influence. Yeah, I think it. I can. I think that no matter. So part of the take um, of critical theory that critical race theory that gets kind of smashed. Uh, by I would say right evangelical uh, mm-hmm. Christians is the fact that it at its at its solution section and at its deepest part 
it is contrary to God holding truth, basically, and this idea that, okay, the, the, uh, the true words from a white person are no less true because they're from a white person sort of thing. So there's like a pushback of that. And then this, you know, it gets tied into sort of the, the, the Marxist, um, you know, like, oh, do we need to like disassemble religion, disassemble Christianity, a sort of thing, mm-hmm. uh, and sort of rise up sort of thing. So that's the overall, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how well I did on that, but that's sort of the overall thing. Yeah. You kind of, you kind of touched on things. Um, I guess my question would be, do you find that there are some um, prejudices that maybe we have as white cisgendered males? Um, d- because, uh, so I don't know if you, I, I can't remember her name, um, but she did an experiment called blue eyes, brown eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No. Um, so it's an older, older lady. Hold on. Let me Google it really quick. Cause I don't want to um, say okay. her name wrong. Uh, t- t- blue eyes. Okay. I want, can I answer your question while you Google it? Or you go for it. Go fast. Okay. Yes. The answer is yes. I think we do. I think okay. we do have prejudices inside of us. And here's, I don't say that as an American. I, I, gr- I, say, I agree with you. I agree with okay. you on that. Yeah. I don't say that as an American. I say that as a Christian. Because here's this. Okay. I think the my pushback to the response to it is no critical race theory is not a satisfy does not offer satisfying solutions to a human heart and racist either systems or people. Like the that the fact that yes, hearing more and educating more and being more influenced by great black thinkers is helpful. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it will ultimately lead to reconciliation. I okay. think it, I, that's just my, my thought. I think it's kind of unsatisfactory, but I also find that when it gets put up against a quote unquote biblical worldview, I think that none of us, here's my hot take. I, I don't think that any of us have a biblical worldview. Mm. I think that none of us truly grasp the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and how how it how we should be as Christians. So when you say critical race theory as a worldview versus biblical worldview, yes, they are out of step, and critical race theory falls in front of a biblical worldview. I would also say that American fundamentalist mm-hmm. patriotism also falls in front of a, a true biblical worldview. And I think, you know, different forms of capitalism fall in front of it. Socialism fall. Like everything is inferior to a true. And I think we at times gra- grasp it for moments, but I think that we are all biased by the ways that we were raised and the country we were raised in and the songs we sang and God bless America. And like, mm-hmm. we've all like, I don't think we have a perfect uh, biblical worldview. I think we're all striving to learn more about what does God think of the world and how should we view people in the world? I uh, like a hundred percent agree with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know if you thought I was going to push back on that. Um, I was ready for it just in case. Yeah. Um, no, I a hundred percent agree with you and we can go into that a little bit uh, in a second, but um, Jane Elliott is the, okay. the lady um, and she does this experiment and there's a ton of videos on YouTube that you can watch of it. And she does an experiment called blue eyes, brown eyes, and um, what she does is she takes uh, she has a group of like 50 people um, and she'll put them and she'll have them come in and everybody with blue eyes. She puts a scarf around their neck and then has okay. them wait in, in a room separate the people with brown eyes. Well, the people with brown eyes are like fed. They're like given snacks or given, uh, you know, um, nice drinks, nice places to sit and with that while they wait. And they're told like, hey, when the blue eyed people come in, like treat them like garbage you know um okay. and they and she even hangs up signs in the main room that says like you know blue eyes get out of here uh hang a blue eye by their toe like basically a bunch of racial slurs but change blue eyes out you know uh-huh. and uh, and then she also makes the blue eyed people sit on the floor you know while all the brown eyed people are sitting in chairs around them mm-hmm. and um and then basically just kind of you know it, it's the, it's the experiment is um that there's something biological about yourself that is seen, you know, mm-hmm. that you can't change about yourself. Right. Um, and, and that you're being judged based upon that. And this is the experience that black people have had throughout the history of at least America. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so I actually found that experiment very eye opening. Um, and that, um, it, it, I felt like it really softened my heart to mm-hmm. the, the plight of, you know, my black brothers and sisters. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. I don't think you have. I haven't. Yeah. Um, check it out. And I would tell anybody to, to really check it out, especially if you really want to, um, to learn more about, uh, uh, I, I think, which is a more positive message concerning the black lives matter movement and really understanding that because that's something that you said, you know, you think that critical race theory brings that into light, kind of that right. um, injustice into light. And that's kind of the good thing that's happened out of it. Right. I think the like I would say to me, it has been helpful. Mm-hmm. And I think if you, I would say that if you filter critical race theory through the fact that and I th- I think even in the in the Free Mind podcast, there's talk about the I'm going to say the word wrong. Is it hegemony? He- hegemony? Hegemony sounds correct, hegemony? but I, hegemony? I have no clue what it means. Okay, so like the the fact that we are through our culture, we are all been like conditioned to believe these different things. So like that like uh, the standard of beauty, we've been taught mm-hmm. by advertisers, we've been taught by media, and like here's what a beautiful person looks like and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it has been helpful to try to identify f- and then taking it to like taking it into, OK, Jesus, like, what do you have to teach me about myself um, and examine? Like, are there things in my life that have led me to have prejudices in my life? Mm-hmm. And I would say yes. Like mm-hmm. and that has been s- extremely helpful because I don't know if you experience this at all. Mm-hmm. I think, for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it first and then I'll kind of feel it, feel it out. I'll go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have learned mm-hmm. that I have racist tendencies in me mm-hmm. that I struggle with racism. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's my first, that's my statement. Okay. I think the sin of racism is a sin that us as white Christians have a very hard time confessing. Mm, mm. I think that it is that like me having that, like there are a lot of sins that I can kind of say and be like, yeah, I'm consumer. I, I, I seek power yeah. or whatever. Like, and it's kind of like, Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. If I came to a small group and said, I just need one ever know. I think I'm racist or like, I yeah. think I have these in me. They'd yeah. be like, oh, hold up. Yeah, you you, think, you would you you would have a better time saying I struggle with porn addiction. Oh, oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You would, yeah, you would have a lot different things you'd be able to admit before that. Yeah, I think that is a problem because I think as Christians we should be the most able to admit our own sins mm-hmm. and know that the depravity of the human heart is my heart is bent on wickedness in a lot of ways. And the fact that this is just one other element of that. Yeah. And I think by being able to approach that and be like, all right, what are the things like, I I don't know. I just, I have not heard a, another white Christian admit to have like to having any sort of racial prejudices or things kind of built into them. I just haven't, I have, I have never heard it before. I've never heard it from the pulpit. I've never heard it from, and I think, but we talk about it like there are racist people out there, or I know right. distant relatives who are, or an older generation is, or, and I know that the word racist is so loaded and it feels so terrible, but that, if yeah, it, that, that was the point, I'm sorry. That was the point I was going to make is that, yeah. um, you know, I think that because the word racist and racism is so loaded that everybody thinks like, like when you say racism and racist, people automatically think of Nazis, KKK, uh, KKK um, right. uh, that, those kinds of things where right. um, I think me and you um, can, can see the nuance in the fact that there are subtle racisms that right. we have within us, you know, and those are rooted in us. And it's almost like a generational curse. Like it's happened so yeah. much generationally that, you know, um, like I have this story. Um, so I, I would confess the same thing that I believe that I have racist tendencies within me. And right. um, some of them are so subtle and unconscious that I don't 
recognize them until it happens. Right. You know, and uh, you know, it's like I can, you know, um, when I was single, um, you know, I, I could have been attracted to black females, you know, but I would have known about the stigmas that mm-hmm. would have, that would have been with that. Um, like if I would have dated that person, mm-hmm. you know, there would have been stigmas and I would have felt those stigmas as well. And so I think that those are things that are within us, but also too. Um, so I had a really, a really good friend of mine. Uh, we're not really good friends anymore. We still talk to each other every now and again. We just, you know, we just lost touch. Um, he's black. And, uh, but I remember one time I invited him over for like a little get together and there was, you know, most of us were white and then he was the only black kid. And it became like this, like, Hey, how can we make fun of his blackness? Um, mm. you know, fit. And I remember my mom came in and she told everybody to leave. She was like, Matt, I am so disappointed in you. Mm. And, but those are things that were instilled in me. And it was, you know, it was, um, I want to, uh, I actually want to bring up th- this one point after I make the story, close out the story. Um, but it was like, I was pressured by the crowd I was within. You know, and because I was more because I had more in common with the crowd, which we were all white, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that I felt that it was okay to take it out on this on my on my black friend, you know, and and uh, I don't know if I ever apologized to him or not about it. Um, Maybe if he's watching, I can, you know, or maybe I'll text him after this. Um, But, you know, that's that's a a point in my life that I feel like it's like this. It's this weight that's still on me and I still struggle with those things. Um, but there's this great, uh, French, um, anthropologist named Rene Girard. Um, I don't know if you ever saw my post that I've I've made with, man, I know uh, your Rene Girard posts. Like I (laughs) I I absorb those nuggets. Those those are great. I I love them. I love them. And he, um, he did a, uh, there's a video of him on YouTube. Uh, he passed away in 2015, but there's a video of him where he does this interview and they talk about Peter's denial. And he talks about Peter's denial in a way I've never heard about it before, where when Peter is there and Jesus is, is during trial, um, there's people there and they're saying, hey, you're one of those Galileans. You're one, of, you're one of those people that was with Jesus. And he is like, no, 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 that's not one of, that's not, I, I'm not a part of that. And they're like, yeah, you are because you have that Galilean accent, you know, and they pick them out that way. Mm-hmm. And, and what it is, 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 is Peter is taken over by the crowd spirit. And even they even make in one of the gospel accounts, they, they make sure to say that it's one of the girls is a young girl, mm-hmm. you know? And so he's being pressured by the crowd to, uh, to fall in with this persecution of Jesus that he, then that's what causes him to deny Jesus three times. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't realize he's done it. Even after Jesus told him he was going to, he doesn't realize that he was doing it until Jesus passes by and looks at him. And that's when Paul realized, or Peter realizes that, what he did, what he did, that he did not right. Jesus, but it was that crowd spirit. And that's the way, um, looking back on the story I just told you about me and my friend, um, that's the way I felt is like, you just get into this mob mentality. Right. And, um, yeah. Oh, ab- absolutely. I, I mean, myself, like raised in a town that in my high school, we had maybe two black people and mm-hmm. hundreds of white people sort of mm-hmm. thing. And there's just, you know, uh, I, I heard quite a few N words in high school, in different yeah. classes and stuff like this was not 1960s. This is 2004. You know, I was, I was hearing, I was hearing these words and um, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I think we have been as Christians, we are in a great position to view this topic because Mm-hmm. We have been rightly taught that Jesus looks and says, "Hey, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. If you mm-hmm. have you have had this anger at your brother, you you have committed murder in your heart." And like murderer, adulterer, all these like really heavy terrible like we have learned that like God is a God who you can uh, you can self apply those words to you and not fear that your heavenly father will rebuke you know will reject you yeah sort of thing like he still he wants you and i think if we you know if you were to say if you were to continue it on and be like if you have this thought of superiority or this thought of uh judgment at a brother of a different race you know race or color 
then mm -hmm. you are racist in your heart sort of thing. Like, I think we have learned how to, and I think that's an amazing thing that we have is that I can on, I can say these very harsh words about myself knowing that one, I can uh, be renewed, mm -hmm. renewed daily. And like, and Jesus can work like transform the sin in my life. Um, while all at the same time being able to look at my black brothers and sisters and be like, I have not been a brother and sister to you at mm. different times, whether consciously or subconsciously. Right. And this is, and I'm not from the fifties or the sixties and I'm not from slavery times, but I am from the early two thousands and nineties. And yeah. yet, and yet like, yep. Yeah, I, I absorbed some of that toxic garbage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that you said, and um, I, we'll, we'll keep this topic to all the way toward the end, is that you said none of us have a biblical worldview. Um, and you kind of mentioned a couple of those things like patriotism and things like that. Um, do you mind going a little bit deeper sure. into that? Because, because I'm, finding, I'm finding this to be something I'm struggling with myself because um, you know, a lot of churches today um, have American flags hanging you know, and, and, and things like that. And that's something that I struggle with um, on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I would say, I don't know that. I mean, that is something that I, I will, I'm going to breeze past politics for a second. So you don't okay. even need to comment on it. I'm going to just kind of breeze past it. Okay. And I'm going to say, I feel like in some ways as a Christian, mm -hmm. I was, I left the room for a second to like go to the bathroom and when I came back, everyone was like a Trump supporter. And I walked back <laughs> into the room and I went, and I went like, hold on, hold on, everyone. Wait a minute. Well, like, what, did, what I mean, like, what, ha like, I truly feel in some ways unplugged from my Christian brothers and sisters in a lot of ways, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of, uh, you know, conservative christians where i i feel like in a lot of ways i'm kind of lockstep and in some ways i'm probably pretty moderate in other ways and mm -hmm. i think probably since living in chicago like there are definitely some policies that i am a lot more i'd say probably in immigration i'm a lot more left-leaning than a lot of you know my friends mm -hmm. um uh, christian friends yeah. um but i do feel like in some ways i have like walked into this and all of a sudden I don't recognize my people around yeah. me because I was like, hold up. Like we're all reading the same tweets, right? Like we all see the same man and we see his same tactics and everything. And it's like, hold up. I, how are we, how is this a thing? So I do feel like I, I stepped out of the room and I came back in and everyone got like brainwashed a little bit. And I'm just like, hold on, what's going on around me? See, so I don't. My, uh, yeah, I, I don't feel that way because um, I, I, I started I'm also to admittedly a little unplugged from a. Uh, at, must have been a time where I was somewhat unplugged from politics while I was like <laughs> starting my career. So maybe I truly did step out of politics for a bit. I'm yeah. Like, Go on. Well, when uh, so when I got saved, I was, I was 17 when I got saved, and I got saved at a Baptist church, and uh, always have have been told like your Christians vote Republican. Right. Same. So, so I think, so I've seen that all the way through, um, a, a, any church I've, I've been at. Right. And, and so it's almost as if like, Hey, if you don't, um, vote red, you know, then you're not really a Christian because, you know, and, um, I don't know if you saw the article, uh, it, it happened, per, I think it was like two or three weeks ago. Um, but, uh, John MacArthur, uh, he said that, uh, there's three things that Christians, need to vote on and that's abortion gay rights and trans rights and those are the three issues that uh, drive christian politics mm -hmm. and um i heard about it on a podcast and i remember the pot uh, the podcast um host one of the things he said was like so we're gonna ignore poverty um immigration and human rights <laughs> and, and yeah. things like that you know even monetary policies like we're not we're not gonna worry about mon monetary policies or anything like that and um yeah, so I it don't really feel... does come down to abortion for a lot of. I mean, like that is sort of the that is the, that's the yeah. one issue, and that that you've been talking about recently on this. Yeah, 
Yeah, I actually haven't gotten to some of the things I um, wanted to talk about, um, which is kind of statistics, because statistically, uh, abortion, um, abortions have been going down. They've been trending down, and they're actually lower than they were when Roe v. Wade was instilled. I mean, I've just been looking into uh, you. You caught me at this moment because I was just looking at a looking at this probably the same a similar article and i was like hold yeah. on a second i need to i need to re- rethink some things because yeah yeah and I, and I th- and i think that and for me what that tells me is that policy doesn't matter as much as we think it does um because one thing about like supreme court justices and like that is uh, most supreme court justices are going to hold a uh, precedence rather than make dramatic shifts in policy so uh they're going to uphold cases and that's how they built the case up to roe v wade because they built it based on precedence and then said mm-hmm. well constitutionally this makes sense mm-hmm. and so that's right. why it even happened yeah um and so to overturn roe v wade and and then the, the same uh, article um said that even if we overturn roe v wade it would only affect about 10 percent of abortions mm. worldwide Okay, or, so, or, or or not worldwide, but you know, countrywide, nationwide. Right. Okay, so I want I, I never answered your question, so I want to answer. Sorry, it. sorry. I know that that's on me because I went, I took a quick uh, politics detour, sort of yeah. thing. Um, but I would say that the worldview that that I have and that that various people have, I find that we have, in a lot of ways been influenced by a message that Jesus never endorsed. And I think um, in a lot of ways, like, and I think financially, I think is one of the ways that it's like the doesn't quite feel and, and helping of the poor and visiting those in prison. And like feels like part of it that has been kind of influenced by a political stance more than by the gospel. And I think to, especially when it comes to like how we view poor people, for Mm -hmm. example, and how we view the poor, it's, you know, I think it's been more influenced in my life by hearing about, you know, like, oh, maybe need to work more and need to, you know, can't have a handout sort of thing Mm -hmm. more than what Jesus says about people in poverty and that sort of thing. And like all of these different layers are on it. And I think when it comes to, you know, I was always taught that America was the best. America was like God's new, it's God's new Israel, God's new Mm -hmm. country. Like, and then you know, and this feeling of, hold on a second, but like, what about the world? What about our brothers and sisters from around the world from different countries? And, you know, do we need to, why is my country better than their country? Like if, if we serve the same God and if we serve the same, like God is the God, not of United States. He's the God of the world. He's the King of the world, King of Kings sort of thing. Yeah. Um, So uh, yeah, I think having a, us not having a true biblical worldview I think if we confess that we have it all figured out, I think we would ha- have to, in some ways, examine: Are we just, in some ways, making the Bible fit? Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of um, you know talk about capitalism and socialism, and the idea of you know, as a church, are we doing what the early church did? No, not not what you know, no way and whatsoever. Like. Are we truly sharing with one another so that no one in our church is is needy at all? Yeah. No, because we are concerned with our own, uh, you know, our own property, our own stuff. Like the whole mm-hmm. private, I own this. I think we've lost stewardship and that sort of thing. And I think that corrupts my worldview. Yeah, um, I I tend to agree. I, I do kind of uphold private property only in the sense that um, one of my big principles that I live by is you can't, you can't legislate morality. Um, And so, yes, I believe that we are, we are called to share, you know, the things that we do have, we're called to share that, but I can't force you to share your stuff Um, because then I would, then I would be enforcing my will, which I coercion, which I believe is violence. Well, this is where you have, this is the, you have, touched on the exact point where policy mm-hmm. and and 
either the ideal or how we should think and live are at odds with one another. Because, for example, right. like the idea of if you were to take, hey, if someone asks for your coat, you know, mm-hmm. give it to them, uh, walk, you know, like if you were to turn the Sermon on the Mount into policies, right? It would, it would in a lot of ways fall apart economically. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, at full generosity and full, like, so I worry that in some ways the idea, like, because they don't work as well in policy, same thing with like, okay, how does it, how does it work, um, you know, f- with policy wise with uh, the poor in our country sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, personally, I can say to myself, okay, as cold, hard policy, fine. Like what actually helps find the data? Okay. I understand that yeah. but when it comes to like how I should view the poor and what I should do personally with my own finances and with my, and I say my own with the, the finances that God has given me, I think almost like I, I fear that the policies have crept into our hearts mm. where the policies were just, to kind of as guardrails to keep dishonest us, us dishonest, greedy people from taking advantage of others. Yeah. And then like, we're somehow backtracking them into our own lives versus letting our own lives be completely generous and completely like letting someone take advantage of you, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. For the sake of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how much do you think Christians should even be a part of politics and policies. I, that's because, tough. I mean, I mean, I mean um, so let's talk politics just for a second. Oh, uh, wait, so we are here. <laughs> we are here. Um, so I have grown to become more of uh, what's called an agorist. Um, I don't know if you know what an agorist is. You did. You found a label that is super cool. And no, I have no idea. Yeah, well, um, agorists, uh, agorism is basically uh, operating outside of, of the government. Um, so, uh, like, if you like get paid under your table, like, if, uh, yeah, like Bigfoot. He's an agorist. <laughs> um, so, like, if you get paid under the table, you know, you're kind of skirting taxes. Um, so, okay. therefore, you're an agorist, you know, because yep. you're not, you're, you're, you're not. But you're also, um, you're also taking yourself away from the participation of mm-hmm. government because because you see it as an institution that doesn't represent your ideals and beliefs properly. And so that's the way that I'm, I have grown to view government is, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what president we have in there. They're dropping thousands of bombs on Brown people across the world, Uh you know, and uh, we say it's in the name of, of security and freedom. But, you know, sometimes it's like, what does, what does the middle East, have to do with us anymore because 9-11 was almost 20 years ago mm-hmm. <laughs> i don't know I've... you want me to respond to agorism sure sure okay. well i i guess i guess the original question which is um how much do you think that how much do you think christians should be involved hmm. in politics <sighs> i think I think they should be involved in politics. Okay. Because I think Christians should be involved with what the world cares about. Mm-hmm. I think that is my, I think my thought is now, I, I think holding the like, well, if Christians were all in charge, we would like fix all these problems. I don't believe that because I believe right. that like Christians, just like any other human, ha- can fall to power. And I think a lot of ways politics, you know, can be very corrupt and very like in order to go into politics, there's some hands you have to grease and different things along the way, which is sad. Yeah. I think that what people care about should be what humans care about should be what Christians care about because Mm -hmm. we are, we are called to care for humans for other Mm -hmm. people. Um, And I think that that is now do I think that Christians should be so, radically Jesus looking so close to that we do look a little bit crazier to the outside world. So I don't know how well that goes into politics. In some ways I picture like, 
you know, like early Christian sort of like, hey, we, you know, you guys can leave, but I'm going to stay behind in the plague and and feed people that are dying of the plague sort of thing. Yeah. Um, whether that mean like, I think knowing, I think being able to say as a Christian, like, I'm going to vote with my, I'm going to say it wrong. I never know his conscience. I have to say it. Conscience. Conscious. No, conscience. Conscience. Right. The other one is being awake or being not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never, I know, I never you, know until I say it. You are conscious. You have a conscience. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think that we are called to vote and, and I would say vote principally, but also mm-hmm. realizing that, which I think we have gotten very far from, is that no politician will save us. And that we are, you know, like searching for a world that people love us and love Christians all like and think we're the greatest. I think by looking for that and by looking for praise from people or protections from our government, that sort of thing um, can end up us idolizing the politicians where I think we should be the most like realistic of like, all right, these people will not save us, heal us. They're not going to uh, bring our land back to God. No politician can do that. Like that we are going to on the small, on a small scale, serve God and influence our little sphere Mm -hmm. around us. So I think it is participating, but at the same time, um, not putting hope in, which I know it sounds cliche now that I say it, but I think that's, it's hard. It's hard to not, get in well, so you, deep that you're um, like this will change things yeah 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 well I, I again that's why i think that i take more of an agorist approach because i feel like we can do that without policy um i think that we can influence change in the world without policy if we just started to do like what you were talking about like if we just started sharing our coats and if we just started to um you know like be wronged you know if you get wrong just be wronged don't right. don't take it up to a court don't take it up to you know these different uh things like that if we um you know kind of gave gave out of our out of the generous nature of our heart you know if we see somebody who needs something we give it to them we don't need a law that tells us to give them something we don't need a law that says you know hey take this portion of my taxes out so that we can you know uh provide for you know for the elderly um, provide for the the poor because we are we are doing that yeah because if the church was doing what they're supposed to be doing those people would be provided for you know and the unfortunate thing is that I've heard that my whole life, but mm-hmm. I we that just haven't been doing that. Um, I you know I but, I hear that yeah. also when it comes to abortion is that right. if you are pro life, you should be so pro adoption that your church. I mean, what I I have to praise our our church up here in Chicago because they mm-hmm. have an adoption fund mm-hmm. that they have gathered in the church. And if any, and any member wants to adopt, you know, I think it's like $10,000 from the church of like, we will help you adopt a child sort of thing. Wow. And I think like that sort of, I mean, if you're going to whatever you want the policy to be, like you said, I agree with you. Like you need like to do the things that the, that instead of waiting for a policy to change, do things to impact the world in a better way. So for example, and like, I'm not going to talk too much about abortion because we've, you've done that a lot already, but like (laughs) there, you know, that whole, like by helping those in poverty, you would actually lower a lot of rates. I mean, Mm -hmm. like that is, that is something you can do to help, you know, out in your area. Yeah. But it's also, like you said, not, you know, you can't change someone's heart with policy. The, where I find that super interesting and we kind of going back to race for just a second is okay. If you are, if you have been disadvantaged by redlining and, and all sorts of like systems in our country that make it so that, um, you know, you don't, you aren't being hired and getting opportunities. For example, I'm a big sports guy. I know most people are not, (laughs) um, but for example, hardly any, uh, NFL coaches, black NFL coaches, and like one minority owner, just because mm-hmm. like NFL owners, a lot of white guys that had money mm-hmm. from a long time ago, 
Yeah. And they hire a lot of GMs because they're comfortable with them that are also white. And those white GMs and white owners hire a lot of white coaches. Mm -hmm. So they institute a Rooney rule, which means that you have to interview one minority candidate for mm -hmm. the coaching position. You don't have to hire them. Um, but that's one of those things where a rule, for example, tries to give more black people the opportunity of an area that is so weirdly disproportionate. And we have a lot of those areas in our country where it's super disproportionate areas. And I think where I'm struck, because I have no idea the correct answers to this, is right. what can we do to help people who are less likely to get hired due to either centuries of prejudice or, or, you know, education not being great in a certain area. How do we help those people? Is that through, is there some, I don't say policy, but is there something to like help sort of thing? Or is that just like, that's not really going to, people are still going to have these thoughts. Well, um, so if I could, if I could just put in, a very um, non-informed opinion mm -hmm. uh, of what I would think might work. Um, sure. Or, or, or not, well, cause I don't, I don't have a solution. There's no, so I don't know a solution that would work now. Um, right. But I, I guess I would say if we could imagine a world where uh, one thing is copyright laws were actually shortened or even non non-existent um, to where uh, like, let's say I started my own football league. Mm -hmm. And and I started my football league with the, with teams named the Patriots, the Jets, and the Buccaneers. <laughs> sure. You know, um, well, I wouldn't have some big corporation that owned those names that would be able to sue me for copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. I would be able to use logos. I'd be able to use everything like that, and I would be able to have my own players. Um, but because the NFL is such a huge thing right now, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's so huge that they're there are probably a myriad of laws that I have absolutely no idea about, you know, right. that would, that would keep me from not only starting my own team, but starting from starting my own league and being able to charge people to come into a stadium, because I would also have to uh, find stadiums that are, uh, that meet code. Um, I would have mm -hmm. to, and if they, and if there's not one, then I would have to build one and then I'd have to meet all the code regulations instead of just being able to go out into a field, charge people money to drive up on their cars and, you know, make some money on my own football league, you know, and start that from like a grassroots mm -hmm. movement. And I think that's a, the thing that a lot of people don't think about is that a lot of the things that we know are built on regulations that keep people down that keep a lot of you know minorities down because again if the nfl wasn't so huge and people weren't making millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and there was some kind of competition because you see how hard the xfl is having to get mm -hmm. off the ground you know and it's because they, they probably have to do something different because there's some kind of regulation or law or copyright mm -hmm. infringement like that that keeps them from doing you know from just literally being another nfl um, and they're having such a hard time doing it and that's being funded by millionaires and billionaires. Right. Um, so how hard would it be for somebody like me to start something where a black person, uh, would have the opportunity to own a team, uh, be able to pay their own players and charge whatever amount they wanted to right. for merchandise and stuff like that. Um, right. The systems the, that are currently built right now are meant to stay like NCAA college athletes. It's meant to people that are making hand over foot right now are wanting to stay, which uh, throwing it all the way back is one of the uh, true tenets to a critical race theory is that mm -hmm. the systems that are in place are meant to stay in place mm -hmm. at the detriment of people that want to improve them or change them. Yeah. And so that's, so that's one of the reasons why I just think that policy isn't going to change it because there's just too many regulations. Like uh, I want to throw out another example here because um, I've thought about running for office before. Nikki mm -hmm. does not want me to do that because one, cause I don't know what office I would run for. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say I had a platform and my platform would be like, let's deregulate something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, you know, uh, let's deregulate something. Well, Matt, what would you deregulate? I would deregulate um, hair salons and barbershops because I get my haircut in my house by my wife mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I would go to a friend's house 
if they knew how to cut hair and have them cut my hair, I don't need regulations to tell me if a barber, uh, you know, mm-hmm. should have a license or not. And so the a question that was raised to me, cause I was talking, I was, I was having this conversation with a buddy of mine who is super pro regulations. Um, and we, we had this conversation about barbershops and he said, well, what happens if you get lice? I was like, well, I wouldn't go to that barber anymore. Like, it's right. that simple. I don't need a regulation for that. I don't need some kind of sanitary. Cause also too, if I walk into a barbershop and it's like unsanitary, I'm not going to get my hair cut there. And I don't think anybody else is going to get their hair cut there. Mm-hmm. So that barber is not going to last very long. And that's the free market kind of doing its job, you know? Um, and so like, if I could, if I had a platform, it would be like, let me deregulate something. And mm-hmm. it would be barbershops and hair salons. I did not know that there was regulation in barbershops. Yeah. Well, that's, they have to have a license. They have to have a license, like, like everywhere. And I think oh. a lot of, a lot of uh, stylists and things like that have to have like 15 plus hours just to become a hair salon. And then they mm-hmm. have to operate under, um, another hair salon Im- and imagine that imagine if like uh, operating costs like you didn't have to have all these regulations sanitary regulations and stuff like that to own a building can i give you okay i'm gonna give you a, a regulations pushback are you ready okay go for it okay is it possible that if you took away some of those regulations which i i hear you saying that and it sounds great is uh-huh. it possible that it would mean that the different establishments that don't hold to any hygienic thing, Mm -hmm. but you offer, you have your taco stand Mm -hmm. and you offer 10 cent tacos. Right. But you're like washing the, your, you, you're washing your meat and your produce and just like toilet water in the back, but it's super cheap. Then the people who can't, who can only afford 10 cent tacos, you end up just Mm -hmm. having, more impoverished people eating the bad tacos and all getting sick. Yeah. It, and, and that organ, like, but they still have to like, they, okay, we can't again, bad example, but they can't afford the, the dollar tacos at the, at the hygienic place. That's better. They just like, well, I can feed my whole family for a dollar with 10 tacos or whatever. So we keep going to this place, 50% chance you get sick or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you have some sort of, uh, disease that only spreads around because people who can afford the dollar tacos are like don't go to that place they wash it with sink water and you know, toilet water in the back is it possible right. that that could actually hurt people in worse positions than us because of the lack of regulation i mean that's a good that's a good question um i don't know i was that was my thought well Not well barbers, i don't know probably yeah, yeah yeah well that's what i'm saying like that's why if i had a platform it would be like let me deregulate something and like the only thing i can really think of that like most people would probably not have an issue with is like barbershops mm-hmm. you know and if i could just deregulate that then i bet the bu- boost there would be like so many people like cutting hair and making money you know that nobody would care you know, they'd be like, I'd, man, there's so so many jobs have been created because Matt deregulated the the barber. Industry. He's a, he's the hero. Here's the hero he's Gotham the, deserves. Exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, the taco stands, um, that's an, that's that's another issue. Um, I don't know because okay, so uh, I used to work at Red Barn Steakhouse. It's no longer in business, so I don't care to talk about talking bad about it anymore. Um, but Red Barn Steakhouse, we um we we kept it pretty clean, but the uh the back door it was a screen door and, and flies would get in, you know? And so, uh, we consistently, uh, as far as like health regulations and stuff like that, um, didn't do too great. You know, um, again, I thought it was clean. Uh, like it, it really wasn't thinking back. But there were it. flies we, in the soup. There were flies you in the can't soup. Have flies in the soup. Well, there was flies in the soup. There was also like cockroaches and stuff. And some, you know? Um, I didn't see a whole lot of that. I saw oh. flies mostly, um, but you know, you're not helping your deregulate case at this point in time. I do want but, cockroaches no, listen, to keep from getting, li- in my food. but listen, but listen, 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 this is my point here. Um, it wasn't the health inspectors that shut the place down. What shut the place down was when news channel eight did a story about how a dirty dining. And then they got then red barn steakhouse shut down for a week. And uh-huh. cleaned everything top to bottom, fixed the screen, uh-huh. and, uh, and but like clean, but cleaned everything. Even got brand new equipment that uh-huh. you know was dirty and stuff like that. All because of News Channel Eight, not uh-huh. because of 
not not just years, but like decades of uh, health inspector regulations. Okay, so you said it was public sentiment that caused change rather than rather than regulation. Any, rather than regulation because the health because the thing is, is they passed enough health inspections that they were still allowed to stay open for business. Got it. So I would think the same thing about the taco stand is that um, you know I, I'm going to say say a quote here and it's and it's um, uh, is this a Rene Girard? No, it's not Rene Girard. Um, well, then what's what's the point of quoting? What's the point? Else? Let's just <laughs> let me just throw this out. Um, it's 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 uh, quoted as Thomas Jefferson, but it's the I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful. Uh, he says slavery, peaceful slavery, mm. but it's kind of the same idea. Is you know with more freedom, there's going to come more risk Mm -hmm. and i and i think i would rather take the risk than be told hey um don't let that guy because the thing is is you got to think about the taco stand guy who's charging 10 cent for tacos the reason he's doing that is because uh the big guys are charged a dollar and he can't compete with them right so how does he compete he's got to charge lower prices right and he's just trying to provide for his family Sure. You know, and his family is probably eating those tacos. He's like, "Hey, they they're they're right. surviving, so why wouldn't any other person survive?" Right. And he's like, "Well, I shouldn't use this toilet bowl as a sink. I, I shouldn't, shouldn't use this toilet bowl as a sink, but it's all I have." Maybe. But one that's also ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't think that any cuz like the thing is is there was a taco guy who uh when I worked at Advanced Auto Parts in Plant City, we had a taco guy who set up his taco stand, and there were people who wouldn't eat there because they thought it was dirty. Um, if I watched that guy one time on lunch break, I had an hour lunch break and he, after every, after every like 10 batch of 10 that he would do, he would literally clean everything top to bottom and then he would yeah. do more, you know? And, and, uh, it wasn't well, because people get sick from your tacos. They're not going to come back to your taco stand, at least in, in this. Exactly. But that's what I'm saying. Like they're, they're not going to come back to the taco stand and it's not going to be because of regulation. It's going to be because of public sentiment and because they're, they're going to see like, Hey, that guy's tacos kill people. Maybe we don't want to eat those. Yeah. 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 But killing one person is probably not good for your taco stand. It's well, no, it's not. But the thing is, that's your dangerous they, freedom. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that's the dangerous freedom though. But, the, um, right. and then also too. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's take, uh, 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 so McDonald's, when they had that lawsuit, the lady poured the hot coffee on her lap or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, that's also another thing that's going to keep people from killing people because the thing is, is like you kill a person, you're probably going to get sued by their family, right? You know, and you can't. W- what do you want to do? I'm going to afford a clean sink to wash the dishes with, or am I going to risk um, getting in a lawsuit after killing somebody and then spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers and all that stuff? You know, so I'm not yeah. sure how we got here, but that's uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> it was my, it was my campaign pitch. Vote for Matt. Oh, it was your, you're right, <laughs> right, right. 2024, I think, is the next. And uh, mine is I'm my uh, my platform is I'm going to stop spam calls entirely, and I will keep bad movies to under 90 minutes. But you would have to regulate that. I know. You have to regulate. That. I know. See, I see. I would Listen, say. I know you're trying to take away regulation, but as I'm you trying take, to take away, away one, I'm get adding another one to a different place. <laughs> that's your that's your campaign slogan. See, Matt wants to deregulate. I want to regulate. Well, well here's the thing. I run one as your vice. Ratio. I run as your vice in, in your presidential mm-hmm. campaign. You're deregulating things. I'm regulating other things. We're like yin and yang. We're like yin and yang. We keep it to one <laughs> one to one ratio. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. If any of you guys are worried about regulations going away, they won't. They're just being siphoned to different areas. <laughs> the taco trucks. See, that's a great platform. That's a great platform. <laughs> Balance. <laughs> Matt, at some point in time, I do have to leave because I yes. do have to get back to painting more tonight. Yes. I'm going back um, to the work site. Well, let's. Uh, do you want to go ahead and just close it at 930 or do you want to try to like, let's just go ahead and end this. ASAP? No, let's do 930. I like okay. it. Okay, cool. Because Nikki's probably out there right now listening to me and saying this is supposed to end at nine and oh what's it supposed to end at nine I'm it was, sorry. it's unofficially at nine like i unofficially try to take an hour but we talked about more than just one subject we have been surfing through surfing through sorry subject now it's okay yeah, yeah, yeah let's talk about church leadership across the our great country i'm just uh <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I, I do love I do love talking church culture for the most part. Um, I do have to say mm-hmm. that is I as far as um, churches in our country, I do have mm-hmm. to say it is such an interesting time. And sometimes I want to work at a church because I find church culture so interesting. Uh, as somebody who works at a church, um, I, well, I've worked at many of churches, so I, I've, I've been employed by at least four churches and wow. you, yeah. And you're and and the, and they're different. Uh, well, no, three have have been the same denomination. Uh, now I work for a non-denominational church. Um, but there's always, there's always the behind the scenes. And some right. people will get this. Disgu- some the interesting part to it. Yeah. Well, some people will get disgusted by it. Um, some people will be able to look past it and see that even some of the politics that goes on is in support of the mission that they have, yeah. and yeah. that you have you you have to you have to you know as an employee you have to say, well, this isn't my church, you know, um, I'm not the lead pastor, and so I what what is the, the vision that he has is the vision that I have to carry as well, yeah. and I think that sometimes it's hard for people because of reformation and and all that yeah. jazz. I think when it comes to uh, the, my my last point, the, kind of the reason why I thought about it is because mm-hmm. I'm part of a church now, which is very interested, uh, interesting because I know that multi-campus um, mm-hmm. branching out is becoming very popular in the U.S. Uh, I'm part of a church that is a kind of decentralized mm-hmm. in the fact that it's not like they, they plant new churches, but then there's no cross as far as sermons and things like that. Um at some point in time, I would like to, we don't have time for this, but I'd love to chat about kind of the mega church. Uh, you know, I, there was kind of the rise of the mega church pastor and yeah. then sort of like a hit back as a lot of mega church pastors had some sort of moral failings or, you know, like got hyper political or whatever along the way. Uh, but then I would like to talk to you about, or actually I do want to ask you this question. Go for it. What do you think is the trend? What do you think is the trend going forward? And what do you think should be the trend of churches in America and how, like, especially with COVID, how they move forward? As far as like, because uh, you mentioned COVID. So do you mean? Oh, like, sorry. I mean, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want it to all be COVID based, but I was just yeah, thinking yeah. like, I know that COVID can be a, a catalyst for different things, but maybe don't even include it if you don't think it's that impactful for the overall course of the American church. But where do you where do you see it going? Like still more satellite churches of central hubs, or well, there is. Well, uh, I don't look at church trends, so I don't really know what what the path is going toward. I have my what my ideal yeah. is what I where I think churches need to go. Um, I think churches need to get out of politics. That's one thing. Um, I, I think we I think we can influence um, better, not through policy, but through just you know affecting change within our communities. Um, and uh, I don't know. I've been seeing this battle, and again, I don't know if it's just my algorithm or whatnot, but I've been seeing this battle between um, kind of these uh, Reformation theology guys and uh, the prosperity gospel preachers. You know, and I think those are kind of the two, the two that are rising to the surface. And I think that, um, I, I think that I tend to lean more toward the reformation guys, Mm -hmm. um, because they, I feel like they are sticking more to orthodox teachings, which Mm -hmm. are, which are less about, you know, God, God's blessings, God's promises and things like that. Because I think that we misconstrue the concept of God's promises with what the promise actually was which man, we gotta we gotta we gotta go in i mean we can't start this now but yeah i'm sorry man i'm sorry man. i think that, is, i think there's you know, I think what does a blessed life actually mean is not what probably what we think it means in our culture well um i was thinking about this other day and i'll kind of end on this and then uh w- we can skim through some of these um i was thinking about this the other day um when Jesus talk, I think it's when Jesus talks about uh, life and life abundantly. He wants to, right. I want to live life and life abundantly. Well, what we think in our American brain is, well, abundant life means that he wants us to be successful. He wants us to not have to struggle. Um, you know, he wants us to, to be independent financially and things like that. Where right. 
I wonder if Jesus married thought, and not be single. We can talk about singleness in the marriage. Yeah, married and not be single and with that have children. Yeah. You know, uh live don't live with your parents, you know, those yeah. kinds of things. But what if Jesus what if what Jesus meant was is that you live life day to day and you help people day to day and you affect change day to day that your life has more meaning and purpose in it without having a lot of stuff. And therefore you live life and you live life abundantly. Right. Right. So yeah, the days are, the days are full of purpose. The days are full of meaning and you are walking humbly with your God. And, uh, Oh man, we could, yes. Yeah. So actually, you know what? You know what? Let's schedule. Let's schedule our next one, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about church culture and yeah. uh, where we where we kind of idealistically see where we want churches and all of that. Not a whole lot of questions. Mostly, uh, Nikki kind of asked. You know, um, what if you're not part of the left or the right? Uh, why do you think libertarians are are left out? Um, oh, that because was I don't our critical race theory time. I think when we were talking about right. I think that's what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, but I think too is uh, because um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people don't recognize that there's a third candidate out there. There's actually more. There's like eight candidates. Right. Um, but Joe Jorgensen is a Libertarian nominee. Um, she's actually uh, quite qualified. Um, I don't necessarily like her as a Libertarian candidate because uh, she still, um, again, I'm more agorist, so I want more deregulation, and I want to see a candidate who wants to deregulate. Um, mm-hmm. But she is for regulations. Like she wants to add some regulations. Um, I'm not for that, and that's why I don't see her as a as a good candidate. Got it. You know. Um, I think I, uh, I think my answer is that libertarians are left out because the left and the right have dominated the. It is a true dichotomy, and when you have these, when you have two warring parties. Uh, the other members will just be seen as pawns of those. Whether that's true or not, I don't think it should be true. I would love there to be five strong, equally strong parties in our in our government. Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's not the case. I I think it's a false dichotomy. I I because yeah. I, I think because independence is like independence is a bigger chunk of the pie. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, and well, so it, it, it's amazing that if you, I, I hate this that when you vote for a candidate, and and I have several times not voted for either of the two leading candidates, Republican or Democrat, and I hate the the mindset of oh you're just casting, you're just throwing away your vote and you're mm-hmm. helping so and so. And I was like, hold on, you don't know who I was going to vote for in the first place, so right. you can't tell which side I am quote unquote throwing my vote away to. I actually I made a goofy post one time and I said, hey, when uh, Gary Johnson was running and I did I voted for Gary Johnson. Uh-huh. Um, but I remember I posed the question. I said, so with me casting my vote for Gary Johnson, who am I helping? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, it was it was like all the Democrats were like, oh, you're helping Trump. You're helping Trump. And then all the you know Republicans yep. are like, ah, oh, you're helping Hillary. It's like, yep. oh, I thought I was voting for Gary Johnson. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So anyways, that was really kind of the only real question my dad is asking some questions but it's like you know goofy questions like you know how much uh how much would matt charge me to let my to let let him cut my hair you know how much i don't don't know i tried to cut my dad's hair one time and it didn't turn out very good so it's more of the fact that i like confidence in myself to cut people's hair i think i think for twenty dollars you'd cut somebody's hair unless your dad's got a lustrous mane if he's got uh, hair then i think it's pretty easy you just buzz it it's down pretty, it's pretty yeah, it's pretty close it's pretty close 20 dollars for a buzz you think is that's not overkill no i don't think it's fine for okay, the for that for that family that family connection you can't pay for that <laughs> that's true that's I mean, true. and by can't pay for that i mean it's worth a lot so you should pay for it okay okay i got you. he also says that you should regulate taco stands because you do not want to die from eating any tacos and you know what i am pro league lover You're- i'm with you regulate taco stands <laughs> regulate taco stands Deregulate, deregulate areas. That's deregulate our platform. That that's our platform. That's our platform. Matt Matt and Nate, twenty twenty four, regulate uh, regulate taco stands. Deregulate barbershops. I like the idea of um, Glover Baranowski or Glover Baranowski, Baranowski, Baranowski. Glover. and next to you is like the D part of deregulate, and next to me is like the like over regulate. I have the over, and then we have arrows pointing towards regulate, and it's. <laughs> Us with facing each other with our fists up, like, listen, we won't fight against another party because all the fighting's internal. 
Bubba Darnask. <laughs> draw it up. Draw it up. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I don't I don't want to ask you to stick around for post show or anything like that. Like I usually ask people to stick around for like five minutes or whatever. Um, just l- how did I do? How did I do with the interview and stuff like hey, that? I, I'm, a, I'm cool staying around for a post show. I didn't know. Are we, is this like high top table, some hors d'oeuvres and a <laughs> couple, a uh, couple of brewskis, you know? Uh, oh yeah. A little, some drinks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have All right. A new drink bar. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, uh, hold on just for like five minutes and we'll do uh, a, some post show wrap up and stuff. All right. Oh, uh, hold on. I did want to bring you back. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Good thing you weren't like eating your dinner. <laughs> All right. Good thing I didn't immediately take off my shirt. Yeah. Uh, um, so where can people find your art? Like, go ahead and plug your art. Sure. It is. I have an Instagram page, which is Nate.Baranowski. My last name is B-A-R-A-N-O-W-S-K-I. Nate Baranowski on Facebook. Uh, NateBaranowski.com is my website, but Instagram is probably the best one. If you're on TikTok, you can also follow me on there. TikTok is a a, a nightmare landscape, but if you want to hang out with me there, you can. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Well, again, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, again, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, episode of MattNews.biz and this conversation with Nate Baranowski. You can rewatch this stream on my YouTube page. Link is in my bio on Facebook. Um, or you can listen on podcasts, which is available on Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts, and I think most other podcast platforms that are available. I hope to see you next time as we explore more Matt News. <laughs>